Hey everybody, this is Rush from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to do a video guide for Arc OS. Now this is a custom operating system available for various retro handhelds. And it's been around for years, I think it actually first came out in November of 2020. And since then, this firmware has gotten very stable and mature, and it's just one of my favorites to use all around. And if you have a retro handheld from Ambernick or Pow Kitty, then chances are it actually might work with Arc OS as well. As of making this video, there are 14 different devices that are officially supported. And what I like about Arc OS is that it's a generally simple user interface, but also a allows you to do a lot of customization if you'd like. And so in this video, I'm going to show you all the various devices that will work with it. And I'll also give you a quick summary of all the various custom firmwares that we have out right now. And then finally, I'll show you how to install ArcOS, some of my favorite features, and then how to tweak your settings as well. And as always, I'll have a written guide to accompany the video here, and I'll have that link down below. Either way, if you want to try a new operating system on your handheld device, I think you're going to be in for a treat. So let's go ahead and grab your favorite drink and snack and dive right in. Okay, let's talk about the devices that work with Arc OS, and we should start here with the Ambernic RG351P and RG351M. These were the first devices that worked with Arc OS, and so I have a special place in my heart for this whole experience. Now, as much as I love these devices, they were also a little bit imperfect. In fact, they were such a pain to develop for that the Arc OS developer actually dropped support for them back in 2021. Either way, if you do have one of these two devices, ArcOS is still going to work on it, but it just hasn't been updated since 2021. Now, there are other devices with the same chipset that are still supported, and that includes the Ambernic RG351V as well as the 351MP. And in addition to these devices, there are other devices that use the same chipset, which is the RK3326, that are also supported by ArcOS. One example is the Powkitty RGB10. In fact, the developer of ArcOS really likes this one because it's so nice and small and pocketable. And honestly, I really like it for those same reasons. In fact, this is a custom metal shell that I bought a couple years back. And to this day, this is still one of my favorite devices within this chipset. Regardless, if you have the RGB10 or you're interested in picking one up, ArcOS will be supported on here as well. Another RK3326 device that works with ArcOS is going to be the Qi Game Force. This one is a pretty unique device and kind of limited in quantity, but all the same, it does have official support. And there's going to be a couple others in this chipset that work as well. I'll have it all listed in my written guide. Now, another chipset that works with ArcOS is the RK3566. And this chipset, has a wide variety of use cases as well. For example, the Ambernic RG503 works with ArcOS, and same thing with a couple others like the Ambernic RG353M and the RG353V. In fact, in this video here, I'm going to use the 353V as my test case. Now, some other devices, even if they don't have official support, just happen to work with ArcOS as well. For example, the Ambernic RG353P is a device that the developer is not a huge fan of, and so because of that, he hasn't made an official support build. But it just so happens that the RG353M SD card image works perfectly in the 353P as well. Speaking of which, let's talk about the different custom firmware options we have for these devices and the variation we have when it comes to user friendliness. And let me preface this by saying that none of these custom firmwares are better than the other. It really comes down to which one's going to be a best fit for you. Personally, I encourage you to try all of them out and see which one you like the best. Now, as a comparison here, I did want to talk about the various levels of user friendliness we can get from these operating systems. And we'll start with the very best, which is going to be Amber Elect. This team here is focused on giving a very good user experience. And so, for example, they have a dedicated website with all these really easy to read tutorials. And they also have a Discord server where they're happy to provide you support as well. In addition, the operating system has been pre-configured with the optimal settings already as well. The idea here is that you could grab an SD card, flash Amber Elect onto it, and just start playing like that. Now, moving down a little bit further is going to be Bodicera. This one also has some really good comprehensive support, including a Discord server and a dedicated website. But probably the major drawback here with Bodicera is that it is mostly focused on PC environment gaming. And so while it does support a a number of retro handheld devices, it's not quite as optimized as some of these other custom firmwares that are specifically made for these devices. However, if you're already a fan of Botocera, say for example you use it on your PC or your Steam Deck, you'll be right at home here. Now, ArcOS as well as Retro Arena are fairly similar. In fact, ArcOS was originally forked from the Retro Arena back in the day. But I would say between the two, I would say that ArcOS is a little bit more optimized and stable, and that's mostly due to the fact that the Retro Arena is on a lot of different platforms, and so the developer kind of has to try to keep up. 
Now, ArcOS does not have a dedicated Discord server, and so if you run into any issues, you have one of two options. The first is to go onto their wiki page, which is very comprehensive, and often you can find your answers there. And then the other option would be to try some of the other retro handheld discords and ask within those channels, and maybe someone can help you out. Now, on the far end of the spectrum when it comes to user friendliness is going to be Jealous. The way I like to describe this one is a hobby project. Essentially, what has happened here is the developer has created their own operating system, and they mostly just work on it for themselves. But they also happen to make it publicly available in case you want to flash it onto your device as well. What this means from a user perspective is that you won't have any support at all. For example, they do have a Discord server, but they don't provide any support within it. In fact, they don't even allow users to submit bug reports, and so if there is an issue, they expect you to develop the fix for it and then submit it as a pull request. And so while Jealous is a very optimized and performant operating system, it is not user focused. In fact, they dropped support for several devices just a few months ago. And that's where unofficial OS comes in. This is a fork of Jealous that essentially preserves some of that development work on those other devices and is a little bit more user-friendly as well. Now, Unofficial OS has a similar stance as well in the fact that their user support is quite limited, but at the very least, they do allow you to submit bug reports if you find something wrong and maybe they'll take a look. In the end, when it comes to performance between all six of these options right here, it is mostly the same. You can probably nitpick one or two being better on certain systems, but as it stands right now, it's really about the user experience. And while I think that Amberlec is the best in that regard, it does not support all the retro handhelds that are out there. In fact, you can see with this chart right here that only the RK336 devices and the Ambernic RG552 have Ambernic support right now. And so if you have an RG353 device, then something like ArcOS or one of the others is going to be your best bet. Either way, if you want to spend more time reading about any of these slides right here, I'll have them linked in that written guide that I'll have down below. But for now, let's get into the good stuff, which is to install ArcOS. Now, if you're using a device that only has one SD card, like the Ambernic RG351P right here, you basically only have one option right here, and that is to get a pretty big card, because you're going to need to have the software files as well as your games installed on the same card. Personally, I recommend 128 gigs or larger. Now, most of these devices actually have a two-card setup, and this is great. Number one, you can take a smaller card, like 16 gigabytes, for example, and use this as your operating system card. From there, you can get a larger SD card and use this to store all of your game files. This is great for a couple reasons. Number one is if something goes wrong with the operating system, like you need to reflash it, then nothing's going to happen to your second SD card. You'll have all of your games preserved as well as your save files. Additionally, if you have multiple retro handhelds that are supported by ArcOS, you can use that second SD card to hold all your ROMs and then use it interchangeably with those devices. And that also includes your save games as well, so if you want to swap between your devices, that'll be a really good setup too. So we're going to do a two-card setup here today. We're going to start with a 16 gigabyte card for our software, and then I recommend this USB card reader. Again, I'll have it linked in my written guide. Either way, let's go ahead and pop the SD card into the reader and then plug it into our computer. Now, if this is not a brand new card, then what I would recommend doing here is formatting it. I recommend using this one here from sdcard.org. And this tool is super simple. All you have to do is just identify your SD card and then format it. And this is going to give you a very clean format to work with from the start. Next, we're going to head over to the ArcOS Wikipedia page. And if we scroll down here to the bottom, you can see a listing of all the SD card images for the devices that are supported. In addition to the file links, you can also see that there is an FAQ section as well as a change log if you want to see any of the things that have changed over time. As I mentioned, we're going to focus on the RG353V here in this video. So you have the choice of either a Google Drive or Mega file. I'm going to go with the Google Drive one here, and then just follow the prompts to download the file. Once you have it downloaded, you'll have to use the app called 7-Zip to extract it. And I already have this installed, but basically I'm going to drill through the quick menu right here, find 7-Zip, and then select Extract here. This will take a minute, and then when you're done, you should have a file that's about 8 gigabytes altogether. And it should be in a .img file format. Now all we have to do is just flash this to that SD card that we just formatted. For this process, I recommend using an app called Rufus. Again, all this is going to be linked in the written guide I'll have down below. So go ahead and download this and then launch the app. It'll ask you, do you really want to do this? And you say, yeah, man, I want to do it. Under device, make sure that you select your micro SD card and then click on that select button here on the right. From there, navigate to that IMG file. It's going to give you another warning here and just press OK. It'll take a few minutes to actually write the image to the SD card, but after that, we're pretty much good to go. At this point, you can close out a Rufus, and then if you look in your PC, you'll see a bunch of different partitions. Don't even worry about this stuff. All we're going to do is right-click and then select Eject. 
From there, we can pop out the SD card and then put it inside the internal or SD1 card slot right here. And then now we can boot up the device. On that first boot, it's going to initialize the system. What it's doing right here is expanding the SD card partitions to match the size of the card. And then it's also going to rearrange some of those files so that everything works properly. Just give it a minute or two. And then after that, you'll be greeted by the main ArcOS menu. And the setup here is pretty simple. You can just kind of navigate through your systems. There's not going to be a lot here because you don't have any games loaded yet. But I do recommend going into the options section here. Some of these ArcOS options are going to be really handy. So I recommend kind of reading through each of these. But for now, what we're going to do here is we're actually going to set up that second SD card. For this, we're going to go into the advanced section under options. And then there's an option here that says switch to SD2 for ROMs. Here, we're going to take a larger SD card. And if this one is not brand new, I also recommend formatting this one first. And we're going to pop it into that second SD card slot on the device. After that, we're going to select this option here and let it run through the program. Essentially, what it's doing here is building out all the different folders for your second card. After that, we're actually good to go. But there are a couple other things I recommend doing in that first boot. The first is to go into the Wi-Fi section here and then connect it to your local Wi-Fi connection. Now, obviously, if your device does not have a Wi-Fi chip inside, you'll have to use a USB dongle. But one of the cool things about ArcOS is that many of its features are tied to a network connection. And so it is in your best interest to have this thing connected online. For example, after I've gone through and set up my Wi-Fi connection, right above that is an option to update ArcOS. And there's no updates available right now, but there will be in the future. That's one of the great things about ArcOS is that it's constantly being updated and you can do it right on your device. Either way, now that we're all set up and connected, let's go ahead and power down the device by pressing the start button and then go down to quit and shut down system. I like to think of these devices as little computers, and so because of that, you do need to properly shut them down so you don't corrupt your SD cards. Either way, once the device has been powered down, we can take out that second SD card and start loading it up with our BIOS files and ROMs. So back on our computer, when we open up that SD card, you can see here that we have a bunch of different folders. And it's going to be intimidating at first, but don't worry, we'll walk you through it right now. First thing I want to give your attention to is the BIOS folder. This is where you're going to put specific system files that are required for certain consoles. And as you can imagine, I have all these listed in my written guide. But to make things easy, you have a couple options here. The first one's going to be that if your device came with an SD card, it likely has a BIOS folder inside. So what I recommend doing there is actually putting the SD card into your computer and then pulling those BIOS files from there. Then you can actually just transfer them over to this SD card and chances are they're going to work just fine. Another thing you can do is search online for what they call a RetroArch BIOS pack. For me personally, I already have my own BIOS collection, so all I'm going to do right here is just move them over wholesale into this folder. Now I've got a ton of BIOS files, way more than I actually need for this system, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. Regardless, we're now ready to start adding our game files. This is probably the most intimidating part of this entire process. Thankfully, the developer has a comprehensive wiki page that'll show you every single system and where to put each of these games. So I recommend checking this out. And within here, you can pick your system and then it'll show you all the different emulators that are run on it. And then also where the ROM folder is and then all of the different file types that are supported. Additionally, if there are any specific BIOS files for that system, they'll be listed here as well. So if you're brand new to this entire setup, I would recommend checking out this wiki page because it'll probably answer most of your questions. So now that you kind of have an idea of how to set that all up, let me show you an example. I'm just going to go through here on my computer on the right, and I'm going to start picking out games and then adding them to my SD card, which is here on the left. I'll start with something like Dreamcast, but then also I can do like Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, everything else like that. I know I'm going pretty fast through this section here, and obviously I'm not going to tell you where to find any games because they're all going to be copyrighted. But the heart of the matter here is to collect your own ROM files and then put them in the corresponding folder. And that's really about it. Anyway, once you've moved everything over, let's go ahead and eject our SD card and put it into our device and test everything out. And here we are with a fully loaded system. The nice thing here is it'll detect if there are files in any of those folders. And if there are, then it'll show that system. But if there aren't, it won't. So it does give you a pretty clean interface overall. Now in the menus, we don't have any box art yet. And I'll show you how to get that here later in this video. But for now, I want to orient you with the emulation station menu. To enter this, you're going to press the start button and you'll have a bunch of options right here. For example, under UI options, you have the ability to change your themes. And there's a bunch already preloaded in ArcOS. All you have to do here is just pick one and then test it out and see whether or not you like it. 
For example, this switch one right here is really nice looking. I'll also show you how to get some additional themes here later in this video. Also within the menu, you have things like the Kodi Media Center. So if you want to stream or play any sort of media files, you can use that. Another interesting thing is that for the RG353 devices, ArcOS has the ability to adjust the image quality too. So for example, under display settings, we can adjust things like the gamma or panel brightness, as well as contrast, saturation, and hue. For me personally, I like to increase the saturation to make the colors pop just a little bit more. And this is probably one of my favorite new features with ArcOS. It really changes the gameplay experience. Additionally, within the UI settings, there's a couple other nice options too. For example, we can adjust the theme to change out some of the colors or other configurations. And then also we can set up the screensaver. This is one of my favorite parts too. What I like to do here is change the screensaver behavior to random video. And I'll show you what this looks like once we've actually scraped all of our box art and everything else. For now, let's keep going in the menu. For example, under the UI settings, there's an option here to make certain systems visible. For example, if you have a system on here you don't really want to show in the menu, you can just remove it without having to delete all your game files. Or others like Pico 8 are already showing by default, but I haven't set Pico 8 up yet and so I'm going to hide that in the menu at least for now. You can also choose which system to show in the menu when you first boot up the device. For me personally, the NES is my favorite system of all time, so we're going to start there. Another setting that's super important for ArcOS is the emulator setting. Within here, you can pick for each system which emulator you want to run. And there are a ton of different options here, but I would say that the ArcOS defaults for the vast majority of the time are going to be the best emulators to use anyway. But if you do prefer certain emulators over others, this is where you're going to change it. It's going to be especially important when it comes to arcade if you're using a specific arcade ROM set and you want to load that one up here. For example, under my arcade folder, I'm using Final Burn Neo ROMs. And as I'll show you later on, that the Nintendo 64 emulator in particular is one of those that you do want to fiddle around with. But I recommend doing that on a per game basis. Basis, so we'll check that out here later in the video. But for now, we're going to work on scraping media to make the overall user experience a little bit prettier. For example, if I scroll through Sega Saturn, you can see I'm just seeing a list of the games. But for others that I've already scraped, like Sega Genesis, you can see I have this really nice box art, and if I hover over the game for a bit, you'll actually see a video too. So let me show you how to set that up. We're going to go back into the main menu and then go into Scraper. Here, I recommend changing your image source to whatever you'd like. It's set to screenshot by default, but I personally like box 2D. After that, you need to add your username and password from screenscraper.fr. It's free to set this up and you only have to do it one time, but once you have a username and password, go ahead and enter it right here. From there, you can go into Scrape Now, and you can also choose whether or not to scrape certain systems, and then just navigate down to Start and press the A button. And this could take several minutes, up to hours, depending on how much media you have. So this will be a great time to grab some lunch or maybe like and subscribe to Retro Game Core. Either way, I'm just going to kind of speed through this process here and show you what the final result is going to look like. Now, when we navigate through our systems, we can see I have that lovely box 2D artwork. And if I hover over the game, we're going to see a video start as well. And so continuing on with our main menu kind of orientation, let's go down to the advanced settings. Here, there are a couple things that are handy. For example, you can set your time zone, which is going to be great when you're playing something like Pokemon, which has a real-time clock. Additionally, if you want your menu in a different language, you can set that here as well. And then finally, there is the quit menu. So if you need to shut down your system or restart emulation station, this is where you're going to do it. Now, the main menu is only one of three different places where you can make some configuration changes. So let's go over the other two next. And we'll go into the options menu next. Now, under the advanced folder, which we've already looked at, here you can do things like reset your RetroArch settings if you'd like. Additionally, there's a Tools folder, which has Portmaster and Theme Master, which we'll check out here in a second. Finally, under the Main Options section here, you have quite a few different apps that are going to be really helpful. For example, you can generate M3U files for PS1 games so you don't have duplicate games showing up in your menu. And you can also remove the duplicate files that'll show up if you use Mac OS to put everything on your SD card. Either way, a lot of this stuff is actually explained on the ArcOS website, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. Instead, we're going to go into the Tools section, and let's check out the Theme Master first. This tool is going to allow you to browse through different themes and then install them onto your device. And so if you don't like the ones that are already pre-installed on ArcOS, you can actually grab them off the internet right here. Another really handy tool is going to be Portmaster, and I've done dedicated videos about this before. But essentially within here, you can install something like 100 different games at once. For example, if we go into the Ready to Run section right here, these are going to be freeware games that you can install wholesale right here. So for example, I'm going to grab a couple of my favorites. This one here is called Super Mario War. And again, because this is a freeware game under the ready to run ports, I can just install it right here. 
Another one that's really good is called Cave Story. This is probably one of the best freeware games ever made. So let's go ahead and install that one too. Now under all available ports, it's going to show both the ready to run ports, but then others that have commercial file requirements. So for example, if we grab AM2R, you can see here in the description, it says that you need to add a specific game data file into the folder. And there's an entire Portmaster wiki page that's available on GitHub as well that'll walk you through this entire process. In fact, Portmaster was made by the ArcOS developer as well. Now after downloading this files, we'll have a port section right here. If I go inside here, you can see we have AM2R, then Cave Story, and Super Mario War. AM2R is not going to work until I add those commercial files, but something like Cave Story is going to boot right up. And so that's going to be a really nice way to try out some of these ports just right here in ArcOS. And some of these commercial file ports are really good too. Something like Shovel Knight or Undertale or even the most recent Ninja Turtles game can all be played on ArcOS. And I've made many videos about each of these games and it'll all be linked in that written guide down below. Now when it comes to actually playing emulated games, a lot of these configurations have been optimized for you already. For example, when playing Game Boy Advance like this, you can see that it's showing a 3x2 aspect ratio instead of 4x3. So there are some nice touches within ArcOS to improve your gaming experience. But there's quite a few things that we can actually tweak within RetroArch, which is the emulator for most of these systems here. And that's going to be the third way that we can make configuration changes and what we're going to focus on here next. To make things a little bit easier, I'm going to plug my 353V into HDMI. And thankfully, ArcOS does have HDMI support for the devices that are capable of it. What you want to do here is power off the device and then power it back up once you actually have it plugged in and then everything will work fine. So here we are in the menu via HDMI. And we're going to jump into RetroArch and make some of my recommended configuration changes. There's going to be two versions available. There is the regular one as well as the 32-bit version. The majority of games are going to play on the 64-bit or regular version of RetroArch, but there are a couple others that are going to work on 32-bit like PlayStation 1. Either way, let's jump into the 64-bit one here and make our changes first. For me personally, I'm not a huge fan of the menu theme that they use in ArcOS like this. So let's go into the settings and then drivers and menu and change it out. You have four different options here. I prefer the XMB one, which looks kind of like a PlayStation 3. Once you've made that change, if you want, you can back out to the main menu here and then go into the configuration file and save current configuration. That's going to save the menu driver to the XMB one. And when we quit out of RetroArch and then jump right back in, as you can see right here, we have that new menu. Now everything's kind of blown up here on HDMI, but it looks great on the screen. But either way, let's just keep going. And the majority of our changes are going to be within the settings menu right here. And we'll do this from top to down. First one we're going to start in is the input section. Now there's a couple things I like to change here. Number one is by default, you have to press select and start twice to close out of a game in ArcOS. For me personally, I like to press it only once. So what you want to do here is find the confirm quit option and then turn that off. Also within the input menu, I recommend going into the hotkey section. There's only two that I recommend really changing. The first is going to be the fast forward toggle option. For me personally, I like to set this one to the R2 button. That means when I press select an R2, it's going to toggle on and off fast forward. Additionally, another one I like to do is to show my frames per second, because for me, I love to see the stats and see whether or not I'm getting a full frame rate. Either way, for this one, I like to set it to the Y button. So I press select and Y to pull this up when I need it. Now, going back to the main settings menu right here, let's keep going through some of these other options. The next one is going to be the saving section. What I like to do here is go inside and then turn on both auto save state and load state automatically. What this means is when you close out of game, it's going to make a quick save right then. And then when you launch that game again, it's going to go right back to where you were. This is one of my favorite, most user friendly settings overall. And really, we're just about done here. Only one other thing I recommend checking out, and that's going to be the achievements or retro achievement section here. All you have to do is just turn this on and then under username and password you're going to want to add your username from retroachievements.org. This is also completely free to set up as well. Either way, once that's set up, I recommend double checking to make sure that hardcore mode is not turned on. That's because with this on, then save states aren't going to work with retro achievements. Now, when you start playing any sort of retro game, and if you're connected to the Wi-Fi, when you do something unique that has a retro achievement for it, you'll get a nice little achievement unlocked pop up right here. And it's just a really nice kind of added bonus when you're playing a game. For me personally, I'm never going to change the way I play a retro game. I'm just going to play it the way I want, but it is still kind of fun to get 
get an achievement for what you do here and there. Anyway, that's really about it when it comes to recommended RetroArch changes. So now all we have to do is just save them. So we're going to go back to that main menu, go to configuration file, and save current configuration. And that's it. We can quit out of RetroArch and we're good to go. But just bear in mind that we only did that for the 64-bit version of RetroArch. You're going to want to go through and do that exact same thing for the 32-bit version as well. That'll give you the ability to have auto save states when it comes to PlayStation 1 and a couple other emulators too. So now that we have this set up, let's go ahead and start testing it. I'm going to pop in here to the Nintendo section and start up one of my favorite games, which is Blaster Master. And as you can see right here, the game's going to start right up and it's going to connect to retroachievements.org and let me know that I haven't unlocked any achievements for this game yet. Another nice feature about RetroArch is that when you plug it into HDMI like this, it scales the image properly. And so instead of stretching the NES game to the full screen, we have it in the proper 4x3 aspect ratio. Now we're going to test out the auto save and auto load function. When we close out of the game here by pressing select and start, it's going to automatically save my game. Now if we start up that game again, as you can see right here, it's booting us right back into where we were before. So it looks like we're pretty well set up overall. Now there are a couple other system specific things that we can do, so let me walk you through a couple of those to give you an idea. And the way we access these is by going into the RetroArch Quick menu. We're going to press select and X to bring it up right here, and then within here there's going to be something called Core Options. And depending on what system you're playing, like NES right here, these options are going to be different. What I like to do for NES in particular is go into the Video section here, and then turn on the Mask Over Scan Horizontal. That's going to push the edges of the image just a little bit into the black bars, and it's going to reduce flickering on the edges. Additionally, within the NES core options, we have an emulation hack section too. Within here, I like to remove the sprite limit. That's going to reduce flickering of some of these sprites in certain games. And so here we are with NES in what I would consider to be an optimal version of this console. We're not having any sort of flickering with the sprites due to that sprite limitation, and we're also not having those artifacts on the edge of the screen, especially on the right. And the nice thing about core options is once you set them, you don't have to save them. They're just going to save automatically. So let's try that out with a different system. We're going to go into Game Boy next. When you boot up a game, a bunch of things are going to happen here, so let me walk you through it. Number one, it's going to log in and see my retro achievements, and you're also going to see the Nintendo Game Boy Boot logo. That's because I've added the BIOS files into that BIOS folder. Another thing you may notice is that the game is in black and white, but you may want to have like a green color like the original Game Boy, so let me show you how to set all that up next. Again, we're going to press select and X to get into the RetroArch Quick menu, and we're also going to navigate down to that Core Options section. Now the Core Options for Game Boy are going to be different than NES, so let me walk you through some of these. Number one, I want to turn on Game Boy Colorization. We're going to set this to Internal. Once you have that set, you can go into the Internal Palette section and choose from a variety variety of different color palettes. For me personally, I like this one. It's called Special One. Additionally, while we're in here, I like to go into the Interframe Blending section and then set this to LCD Ghosting Accurate. This is going to make the overall experience feel a little bit like an original DMG Game Boy. Now when we start up the game, as you can see right here, we have this nice subtle green color to it, which looks really good. And when we move the character around, you can see there's a little bit of LCD ghosting too. Looks really nice. But there's one other thing I think will really improve the experience, which is going to be shaders. For this, we're going to go back into the quick menu by pressing select and X. After that, we're going to scroll all the way down to the bottom until we find the shaders section. Within here, we'll go into load and then shaders GLSL. Within that folder, we want to scroll all the way down to the handheld section. And then finally, within this one, we're going to scroll all the way down to LCD 3X. Now, obviously, any of these other shaders will also work, but this one happens to be my favorite. And now we have this nice LCD grid to go along with that LCD ghosting and colorization. For me, I think it looks great, and so I want to save it this way. So we'll go back to the shaders section and then select Save. And then here, we're going to select Save Core Preset. That means that any game that runs with the Gambate Core for Game Boy or Game Boy Color is going to have the LCD grid. And now to test that, let's try out a different game. And as you can see right here, we have DuckTales running with the LCD grid as well as the ghosting and colorization. And if we try out a Game Boy Color game which runs the same core, you can see here it also has that same LCD grid. So those are now good to go, and you can do this with a variety of different systems depending on your preferences. Now for Nintendo 64, I mentioned that certain emulators are going to work better for certain games. 
Let me show you how to set up a per game configuration for these. What you want to do here is press the select button to bring up the options menu and then select edit this game's metadata. The third option down is going to be the emulator and this is the same as in the emulator options but specific for this game. And so for example with F-Zero GX I can go in here and choose from a variety of different emulators. This is going to work great because with the systems that run on Arc OS, Nintendo 64 usually doesn't run really well. But it may be that there's a certain emulator or core that's going to work best for certain games. And that's one of the nice things about Arc OS is you have the ability to tweak this on a per game basis for Nintendo 64 and others. So what I would recommend doing here is if you have a Nintendo 64 game that is having issues with running with the standard emulator, you can go into here and experiment with all the others until you find one that might be a better match. Now not every Nintendo 64 game is going to run at full speed, but you definitely have the ability to improve your chances by fiddling around. Either way, that's where you can make your changes. You can select the different emulators, and then for certain ones, you can also choose a core within them as well. Altogether, you've got a lot of options right here to tweak your settings if you'd like. Now, other systems like Sega Saturn use a standalone emulator because it works better than RetroArch. And the setup here will be a little bit different. For example, with Saturn, you press the select button to bring up the quick menu. And within here, usually what I do is go into configuration, and then often I have to set my aspect ratio manually to 4x3. Additionally, if you go into player 1, you can turn on analog mode. And that's going to be great if you don't want to use the D-pad for certain games like Panzer Dragoon. Now, much like with Nintendo 64, Sega Saturn is not going to run 100% on the systems that are supported by Arc OS. But thankfully, Arc OS has been optimized pretty darn well. So when it comes to certain systems like Nintendo 64, PSP, Sega Saturn, and Dreamcast, yeah, they're not all going to play at full speed, but many will. Okay, next let's talk about a couple other features that I think are really awesome. To start, I love the fact that Arc OS has interchangeable cards for different systems. For example, I can take the game card from my RG353V and then plug it directly into my 353M. Now obviously I need to have Arc OS flashed onto the first SD card for both of these systems, but after that we're going to have parity between the games and also the save files too. So if you'd like, you can jump between these save games on various devices that are supported by Arc OS. Just bear in mind this is only going to work on the devices that have a two SD card setup. Another thing to remember is that the RetroArch configurations are saved on the first SD card, not the second. So things like setting up the autosave and auto load need to be done on each of these devices in order to work between them. But once you have it set up, it's a pretty seamless experience and pretty awesome too. And finally, let's circle back to the screensaver function that I mentioned earlier in the video. And now that we've scraped our box art and media files, we'll actually have all those video files to use. What you can do is either wait five minutes for the games to start up, or you can press the select button while in the main menu like this. From there, it's going to pull up all the games that are installed and run those videos for 30 seconds. You can also alternate between them by pressing the select button again. Now, the cool thing here is that if you find a game that you want to actually play, you can press the start button and it'll boot the game right up. This is a feature that's been around for years and is also on other custom firmwares, but man, I really love it. It's a really great solution for those times when you just really don't know what to play, but you need some inspiration. Anyway, that's really about it for this video. I just wanted to walk you through the initial setup for Arc OS and then also talk about why I like it so much. Like I mentioned before, there are many different custom firmware options available for these various retro handhelds, and none of them are really better than the other. After all, most of these developers share their work, and so because of that, the performance is going to be just about the same with all of them. It's really going to come down to what user experience you prefer the most. For me personally, I think Arc OS is just a really happy medium for me and my playstyle. I like the idea of having a very simple menu interface, but then also the ability to change themes and maybe download some extras if I'd like. And then additionally, I have some pretty robust settings options too, both within the main menu and then the options section. And then finally, of course, within RetroArch as well. Either way, I hope this video was very helpful for you and make sure you check out that written guide that I have linked below. That'll walk you through the entire process of this video and a couple extra things too. And if you enjoy Arc OS like me, I recommend you consider donating to the developer. They've been constantly working on this firmware for several years, and of course they're not doing it for the money and really the love of these handhelds, but it's always nice to share your appreciation so that they can maybe buy a nice cup of coffee. And of course I'll have links to their donation page in the written guide and also in the video description below. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.